Welcome to Let's Clear the Air, a podcast sponsored by the Allergy, Asthma, and Sinus Center, dedicated to educating listeners about allergies, asthma, and immunology. Welcome back to Let's Clear the Air, all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I am your host, Liz Edwards, and today I am with Dr. James Kidd in our Blue Bonnet location, and it is so good to be with you, Dr. Kidd, today. I'm excited we get to sit down. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. We are focusing today on all things outdoors. Um, I like to spend a lot of time outside. I think most people do, especially this time of year. And um, my first question for you is, what are some of the big pollen triggers in Louisiana going into the summer months? Well, they, I'm glad you limited the question because um, we have pollen in the air virtually every month of the year. Right, and right. Yeah. We used to do pollen counts here in town. So I have a good idea of when the pollens are out and when they're not out. And right now we are in the peak of our grass pollen season. And the grasses start pollinating actually in late February. Oh, wow. And will continue to pollinate through the first frost in the fall. But people that think of grasses, um, I think of uh, their lawn grasses, like from like uh, zoysia grass, St. Augustine grass, centipede. These do not pollinate much. Most of the grasses that cause allergy, they look like weeds. And we have several different species here, beginning with a grass called annual bluegrass in uh, February that's actually a tiny or dwarf Kentucky bluegrass. And it will pollinate until it gets hot, say in um, late March or April. We have other grasses here. We have perennial ryegrass. We have Italian ryegrass. We have red top grass. We have Johnson grass. So we have quite a few grasses, and, and these are called the pasture grasses. And as I said before, they look more like weeds than they do your grass in your yard. As it gets hot, these grasses tend to die out or go dormant. Then the major grass pollen starts pollinating. That's Bermuda grass. And Bermuda grass starts pollinating in early May and will continue to pollinate into the fall. It has a peak in May and June. Um, it's a tiny little grass. If you have any spot of grass that dies in your yard, it'll fill in with Bermuda because it's very hardy. Um, the other thing about Bermuda, if you mow it, it'll grow back and pollinate again. And in my opinion, it is the most significant grass pollen we have in this area. And it's it, it not only of a grass pollen, but probably of all the pollens. And the only one that comes close to it, as far as significance, I think, is oak pollen. So, so right now we are in our peak grass pollen season. Um, That's got to be so hard for people who are prone to grass allergies, who need to go out and mow the lawn, or would like to spend time outside. Um, what what do you recommend? Where do you start if you think you have a grass allergy? If you, the, the typical symptoms are stuffy nose, runny nose, post-nasal drip, multiple sneezing, itchy, red, watery eyes. Um, these symptoms are mostly going to be precipitated by being outside. And it, in taking the history, you can get the seasonal flare. But like a lot of allergens here, it can be deceiving because they go into a chronic pattern where they have this type of allergy most of the year when it's pollinating. Uh, cutting grass has will stir it up. Mm -hmm. Even walking through a lawn where the grass hasn't been mowed will, will stir up the pollen. I would imagine there's a lot of people walking around with grass allergy that don't even know it or, or don't know how bad they really feel because maybe it's something they've dealt with their whole lives. Yes, and it, it, it can go into a chronic phase where the nose is just chronically stopped up all the time. Mm -hmm. It's gone past the hay fever phase where they have the acute symptoms of itching, watery eyes, runny nose. 
And so a lot of patients are even are unaware that they have this grass pollen allergy. So let's talk about diagnosing grass allergy. Um, what a first visit looks like and, and how we can get to the bottom of, of what it is we are allergic to. What, what does that entail? Well, as I said before, the first thing is to get the history. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, the next thing we do is with physical examination. Uh, there are certain physical findings in the nose that are very characteristic of allergic patients. Uh, for example, instead of nice pink nasal membranes, they have very pale nasal membranes. Um, then we do skin testing with the uh, pollens. Now for grasses, we use Bermuda and we use four or five other of the pasture grasses. And so we put a drop, a tiny drop on the back and then we prick it. And what you do is you reproduce on the back the same thing that's going on in the nose. If it flares up, swells like a mosquito sting, then that then you have hypersensitivity to that particular grass or that any other allergen for that matter. And From so it, there, what is the uh, treatment protocol once you develop or once you realize that a patient is has a true grass allergy? Generally, grass allergy shows up where they're allergic to most of the grasses. Mm -hmm. If you've lived in the south, south of the Mason Dixon line, you likely become sensitized to Bermuda. Bermuda does not grow north in the north. And so patients down here, we have both the pasture grasses and the northern grasses. And so a lot of patients will react to all the grasses that we skin test them with. And that's not unusual at all. And I tell the patient that any grass we tested you with, you would be positive to. And so then we determine that they've got this universal grass pollen allergy. From there, we can prescribe medications or allergy shots. Can we review the allergy shot process? And, and can you talk about what is actually in the shots that are being given in our clinics? Well, if you, specifically, if you're talking about grasses, mm -hmm. um, we treat with a group of, of pasture grasses, uh, the rye, the bluegrass, red top, and we always treat with Bermuda down here, especially if they're allergic to it. And these shots are, it's a desensitization process. They start out at very, very low doses in the shots. Each injection is increased about 50% each week. Or each. And then they work up to very high doses of the shots. And the, the extract in the shots, very high dose. As they become tolerant to the shots, the high dose of the shots, they become tolerant to it in the real world where they inhale the pollen. Um, generally, these shots are given weekly for the first year, and then every two weeks for the second year, and then monthly after that. Now, in our clinic here, if the patient wants to, to get to a higher dose faster, they can take shots twice a week. How long in your experience does it take for a patient to see relief from allergy shots? I understand it's a marathon, not a sprint, but realistically speaking, when can patients start to see results? They should be better by the next season. Okay. If they start this season, they should be better next spring. Mm -hmm. um, and if they've stayed with the injections and gotten them at least once or twice a week, then by no, in one year, they've worked up to a pretty high dose and they should be in the desensitization phase by then. It really sounds like an investment in your health for the long term. It's a very good investment. And because it's been shown that people that took four or five years of allergy shots as a child, the effect lingers into adulthood. The positive, they seem to be less effective, less allergenic, less less allergic prone if they've taken shots as childhood. Uh, one of my things that I do with my patients that are very sensitive, when they get to the monthly shot, I leave them on that indefinitely. And I tell the patient, think of it as 12 shots a year. Especially for the sufferers. And when you, when you get to the end of it, I'm an allergy patient myself. Um, 
you, yeah, you'll do anything to maintain. What is the, my next question for you was going to be, what is the youngest age that you would put on allergy shots? Generally, I've uh, started at four to five mm -hmm. at the youngest. Um, a child between birth and adolescence is in a dynamic stage where the immune system is changing and still developing. Mm -hmm. So you could have a four-year-old and skin test them then and then skin test them again when they're eight years old and have a totally different result. So I'm not too quick to put the very early, the very young ones on allergy shots because things are going to change in the next couple of years, mm -hmm. especially if they're under six. In keeping with the, you know, outdoors, um, let's talk about exercising. Um, exercising outdoors can really bring on more uh, sensitivity to what's around us. If you're talking about becoming sensitized to pollen and developing nasal allergy or asthma, if you do exercise outdoors, obviously you're exposed more than someone mm -hmm. that's sedentary and indoors. Um, one thing that can happen is somebody that's running or a jogger or plays a, exertional sports inhales a lot of pollen into their bronchial tubes. Mm. And so that can also be sensitizing. So the best way to avoid pollen outdoors with regard to some pollen is to exercise later in the day. Like how later? Like um, you thinking after dinner or? The, the reason for that is, for example, ragweed pollen in the fall, late summer and early fall, it pollinates from before dawn till about noon, and then it stops pollinating for the day so you limit your outdoor activities to later in the day much later in the day and you'll have much less exposure to ragweed pollen now the trees and the grasses have that variation also they tend to more pollinate early in the day but the ragweed especially by noon it's about pollinated for that day and people think it's the, they think it's the temperature change that triggers pollination. Yeah. It's the change in light. Less hours of the day is what triggers. Less sunlight is what triggers the pollen. Um, that is so interesting. I never knew that. Um, but yeah, I thought it was the temperature all along. So that's good to know. So we need to basically put everything off until the afternoon. Yeah, temperature can affect it. Uh, for example, excess moisture, you have right. far more rainfall, you have far less pollen. If it's cold, it'll inhibit the pollination. But the, under ordinary circumstances, the sequence has to do with the number of hours of light during the day. One of the other things um, that everyone encounters being outside, insect bites and stings. And we actually have treatments for for some of them. Can you describe what you treat as far as uh, venom allergy goes? Yes. Um, when, when we speak of uh, venom allergy, we're talking about the Hymenoptera order of insects. And this includes wasps, yellow jackets, honeybees, wasps, I mean, white hornets, yellow hornets, and fire ants. And any of these insects can trigger either a very painful local reaction, a large local reaction with swelling, say, going out the entire extremity if you're stung on the hand, or a generalized life-threatening uh, anaphylactic type sting. What do you do for the patients that come in and tell you, well, I was stung and I had to go to the ER and they told me to follow up with an allergist? Um, what would be the protocol for treating that patient long term? Well, generally, we wait about two weeks after the sting to do the testing because for some reason, the immune system is somewhat numb after a sting and may not show up on testing. Mm -hmm. So then we do testing and you can either do skin testing with prick puncture skin testing or intracutaneous skin testing, or you can do blood testing. And what you determine is a specific allergic antibody 
that potentially could trigger a life-threatening reaction. Um, depending on that, depending on the level and which insect, these patients can be placed on allergy shots with the actual venom of the insect, except fire ant. The fire ant is still the whole body. The other insects are the actual venom. This is the one thing in allergy that's close to 100%. These patients will not have a reaction most of the time if they reach a maintenance dose on these insects. That is huge. That's a huge quality of life, especially for the people who work outside. Um, yes. To, yeah. You know, to know that you are covered. That's amazing. One thing interesting about insect venoms is as with all allergy starts, we start with a very low dose and we work up to a very high dose. When these patients, for example, on honeybee, reach a maintenance dose, it's equivalent to two unmolested stings. So they're pretty well desensitized. Wow, yeah. The maintenance dose. That is really comforting and reassuring to know that there, there is that treatment available so a lot of people may find that they don't feel good when they're exercising. And I know we have yet to touch upon exercise-induced allergy. Um, what does that look like? Well, there, there are several different types. Uh, the most basic exercise-related allergy is exercise-induced asthma. And these are individuals that the stimulus of exercise provokes wheezing. This can be prevented by taking a couple of puffs of albuterol inhaler, which is a bronchodilator, 20 minutes before exercise. Mm -hmm. We don't see this much as a problem anymore in asthmatics because they're on these long-acting medications that they inhale twice a day, such as Simbacort or Advair. The patients on these medications don't wheeze when they exercise. Most of them don't. So we don't see the pure exercise-induced asthma that we used to see, especially if they're on maintenance medications. Let's talk about the other types of uh, exercise. Um, well, the next one that's been known for years is what's called cholinergic urticaria. And this is heat-induced hives. And for some reason, if anybody exercises, their core body temperature goes up a little bit and they break out in hives. And they can have very itchy, generalized hives, and occasionally they can wheeze. Um, this can be blocked by specific antihistamines also. I think my daughter has that. <laughs> then there's its cousin, what's called exercise-induced urticaria. And that is the patient that exercise, and they break out red whelps, big hives. Uh, there are medications that can block that also. And then the most serious type is the exercise-induced anaphylaxis. And for some reason, the stimulus of exercise makes some patients prone to anaphylaxis. And they generally start with symptoms of generalized warmth, itching, maybe some hives, shortness of breath, mm -hmm. uh, near fainting, and they have to cease exercising for the day. Uh, there are some things that can be done to help prevent that. Then it's been extended beyond that in that there's food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis. They will, only ex they will only anaphylax with exercise if they've eaten food or a certain food within two hours of exercising. That is, before exercise. And so this can also be diagnosed and prevented. Wow. So it's actually a food that they're allergic to? For example, there's some that any food within two hours before exercise will pr make them prone to have an allergic reaction when they exercise. If they don't eat before the exercise, they don't anaphylax. Wow. So subgroup with the food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis. For example, if they eat celery two hours before exercise, they will have an anaphylactic event. I had one in this clinic a few months ago, this young lady, tomato. She can eat tomato any other time, but she can't eat it two hours before exercise. What's interesting about these patients, 
with the exercise induced anaphylaxis. They're usually what I call elite athletes. And I define an elite athlete as someone that plays team sports. So they're really, really stressed during the exercise. The other thing interesting about this is most of them already know it when they come in. They've already identified the food. That is fascinating. I did not know that was, that was even a thing. Uh, these patients that have it generally understand their condition very, very well. Mm -hmm. They follow the precautions and they can exercise anytime they want to with the limitations. That is fascinating. Well, we're, we're just learning something new every day around here. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. It's You're been welcome. so good to be with you today. My pleasure. Enjoy talking about it. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Let's Clear the Air. Please consider following this podcast. And remember, if you want helpful and accurate information about allergies and asthma, our allergy experts are here to clear the air.